In this video, I'm going to talk about innovation in board game design. How important is it really? Hi, I'm Adam Porter. I started designing card games and dice games back in 2013, and I currently have seven games on the market. One of the most common bits of advice that I hear from publishers and other game designers is that publishers are looking for genuinely new concepts, innovative ideas which allow them to stand out above the thousands of other games released each year. But the question I want to discuss today is, do they mean it and is it a sensible business approach? The truth is that most games which are considered to have popularised a certain genre were not actually the first game of that type. The true innovator is often forgotten. So let's look at card drafting, the process whereby players pick one card from their hand and then pass the rest to the next player at the table, thus amassing a selection of cards to score points. Antoine Bowser's Seven Wonders was first produced in 2010, and for most gamers it'll be the first card drafting game which springs to mind. Later in 2013, Phil Walker Harding's Sushi Go took up the mantle, but neither of these games was the first. Satoshi Nakamura's Fairy Tale was a card drafting game released in 2004, and of course pre-game drafting was already familiar to players of Magic the Gathering. Legacy games are considered to be one of the big board game innovations of the last decade. In these games, players work through a campaign of separate games where the outcome of one game directly influences the next. The defining feature of a legacy game is that components are permanently altered as you play. You write on the board, you tear up cards, you place stickers over components. Matt Leacock and Rob Davio's Pandemic Legacy is the most lauded example, and several other games have followed. But Davio's Risk Legacy predates all of these, but garnered far less fanfare. One hugely popular mechanism in modern games is worker placement. So on a player's turn, they place a worker, a token, onto an action space and they gain the reward, thereby blocking other players from taking the same action. Uwe Rosenberg's Agricola was released in 2007, and it's probably still the defining game in the genre. But William Attia's Kalos brought the mechanism to the attention of gamers in 2005, and the invention of the mechanism is credited to Richard Brees in his 2000 game Keytown. How many people own a copy of Keytown? Cooperative gaming is hugely popular right now. Matt Leacock's Pandemic was released in 2008, and it's one of the most successful modern board games. Pandemic is credited with spearheading the rise in popularity of cooperative gaming. But Rainer Knizia released his Lord of the Rings cooperative game in 2000, and of course there were many cooperative games in the children's educational genre that predate that. Antoine Bowser's Hanabi was heralded as a hugely innovative new game in 2010 that went on to win the Spiel des Jahres. In this game you can't see your own cards, and you have to deduce what cards you're holding based on the clues from the other players. This mechanism is implemented very effectively in Hanabi, but the core concept was used in Alex Randolph's 1985 game Code 777, and that game credits Robert Abbott as co-designer because it was directly inspired by his 1963 game What's That on My Head? Reggie Bonasse's Dice Forge was an exciting new concept in 2017. The game had you clicking new faces onto your dice throughout the game and rolling and re-rolling to generate more income, which in turn allowed your dice to get better and better. The game didn't capture quite as much attention as I expected, and you don't hear much about it four years later. But it's worth noting that that dice drafting concept was used previously in Stephen Glenn's Rattlebones in 2014, once again to little fanfare. There are three key examples that I can think of which leap out as truly innovative designs. The first is Dungeons and Dragons in 1974 by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. The second is Magic the Gathering in 1993 by Richard Garfield. And the third is Dominion in 2009 by Donald X. Vaccarino. Of course, every publisher hopes that they would spot an industry-changing idea such as one of these three. But the tiny number of examples indicates how unlikely it is that this sort of innovation is just going to land in their laps. Although Dominion was heavily inspired by Magic the Gathering and Corey Konezka's earlier game Starcraft utilised a similar deck building mechanism, Dominion was the first to really take that system and make it the entire focus of a game. Many, many derivative products followed Dominion, and some early examples like Arctic Scavengers and Thunderstone were very close to the core Dominion gameplay, but they played up the storyline. 
Ascension became popular because it reworked that central market mechanism. And the legendary series of games applied deck building to a wide range of film, TV and comic book tie-ins. Quarriers swapped out the cards for dice. And Puzzle Strike, Orleans and Quacks of Quedlinburg utilised a bag of tokens in place of a deck of cards. Each game had its own unique feel, but the core Dominion DNA is always easy to spot. John D. Clare's Mystic Veil introduces acetate cards which can be layered on top of each other in plastic sleeves to create unique cards. And the publisher, AEG, makes this a selling point, often referring to the innovation on display in their card crafting system, and they've revisited that mechanism in multiple games. Nevertheless, this is really an example of iteration rather than innovation. The core of Mystic Vale remains deck building in the vein of Dominion. I don't believe that being innovative is the key to standing out. It's more important to be distinctive, and this is achieved by having a good idea and executing it well. Let me know in the comments if you can think of any other truly innovative games which have had massive success. In a previous video, I discussed ideas and execution and the impact they can have on sales. So simply put, Agricola is more renowned than Kalos or Keytown because it executed the worker placement idea really well. Likewise, Seven Wonders surpassed Fairy Tale because of its execution, not its innovation. In 2015, I was an unpublished game designer. I attended Essen Spiel with a selection of prototypes, three of which went on to be published over subsequent years. As my earliest designs, none were created with a product design approach. They came about from a mixture of inspiration and experimentation, rather than being designed with an end user in mind. I talk about the product design approach to board game creation in one of my earlier videos. Two of those designs, Picoco and Throne, are my most innovative games yet. I was a fan of trick-taking games, and I was also enjoying lots of small dice games at the time, and I decided to experiment with creating a hybrid of the two genres. I would create a trick-taking game which used dice instead of cards. Now, I never stopped to consider whether this was a useful product or something that players were looking for. I just knew that it excited me, and to my knowledge, it had never been done before. WizKids licensed Throne, and the following year, Schmitzpieler released a trick-taking dice game called Skull King the Dice Game. It was very poorly received, and while the game was very different to mine, it was the first indication that this might not be a style of game that gamers were looking for. Ultimately, despite the innovation in my game, it never really found a market. There were two potential markets I had in mind, trick-taking fans and dice game fans, but in reality, dice rolling isn't really a genre that players attach themselves to. The best dice games are casual affairs, likely to be picked up by families. They're not generally as complex as Throne, which features changing rules in each new round. Unfortunately, the trick-taking fans weren't all that enamoured with the game either. The increased randomness brought about by rolling handfuls of dice didn't appeal to those players, and it turns out trick-taking gamers are quite particular about their tastes. Some of these players will have been playing trick-taking games with their families and friends throughout their whole lives, and they will have very set ideas. In some European countries, trick-taking is almost like a national pastime. My point is, the innovation in Throne did not bring commercial success. I was inspired to create Picoco while watching a video review of 2013's Bomb Squad by Dan Keltner and David Short. This was another game utilising similar mechanisms to the then recent Spiel des Jahres winner Hanabi. In Picoco, you were once again playing a trick-taking card game, but you couldn't see your own hand of cards. Now that was a strong hook, and publishers bought into it when I pitched the game. Picoco had a strong visual appeal, and this caught the attention of gamers and other industry folk. The game even won some awards. Ultimately, the game sold okay without setting the world alight. But as with Throne, some of the traditional trick-taking fans were a little bit turned off by the subversion of their favourite mechanism. But Brain Games executed the idea well, and it managed to overcome some of the hurdles as a result. If you look at a few of the titles which have had great success over recent years, we're talking Wingspan, Everdell, Terraforming Mars, you'll find that none of these games are truly innovative. They all have fun, engaging gameplay, building on well-worn mechanisms without straying too far from that beaten path. And they all have great themes with appealing artwork and components. The designers and publishers of these games have recognised that real success comes from understanding your customer and giving them what they want, rather than creating something unfamiliar and unintuitive just so you can say that you were the first. Unique experimental design serves to push forward an art form or a craft 
but it doesn't always translate to commercial success. If an idea is too out there, it's going to be harder for a user to adopt. Consumers are looking for convenience, not products which create a burden or add stress into their lives. A slight twist on a familiar concept has fewer barriers for a new user. There's a reason why toys repeatedly use the same worlds. Dinosaurs, trucks, fashion, role play. Yes, it's been done a million times before, but for each child, this new product may be the first time they've encountered a toy from that world. You don't have to be the first. You need to be the most prominent current iteration. This is equally true in board games. The lifespan of most board games is one to two years before they essentially become a forgotten title with the final copies being removed from the game stores. Only a handful of titles each year surpass this and have a longer life, or may even become evergreen titles. When a new hobby gamer encounters your worker placement game, it may well be the first that they've ever experienced, and every other similar game which has gone before is irrelevant to that user. 20 years ago, I was an actor in an improvisational theatre group, and one of the mantras of the storytelling guru Keith Johnston was be more boring. If the audience anticipated a particular plotline and you sidestepped it by giving them something wacky and original and weird, you'd throw them for a loop. The audience's appreciated familiarity. It's the reason that all fairy tales follow a predictable pattern. I would encourage board game designers to focus less on outthinking their peers and more on executing their products brilliantly. Be more boring. Trust that amazing gameplay comes about by iterating on existing concepts. Setting aside the gameplay mechanisms, I would fully encourage publishers and designers to be innovative with their presentation, their theming, their components, their marketing, their packaging, their communication. The beauty of Elizabeth Hargrave's wingspan is not that it's innovative, it's that it's gloriously, masterfully boring. It offers players something familiar and accessible in an incredibly distinctive and attractive package. As a designer, that's my goal. Iterate on and improve existing concepts. And you never know, a moment of inspiration might just offer up the next Dominion or Magic the Gathering. But if you strain and strive to achieve this, if you make innovation your goal, you're probably going to try too hard, and I suspect it'll never happen. Anyway, thanks for watching, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.